Okay, we've learned a couple interesting things about long-term memory already. First off, despite being virtually unlimited in capacity and duration, we definitely don't store and remember everything that we experience or think about or get exposed to. That would be overwhelming and insanely inefficient. So we only store some things. And of that, we've seen that we're not guaranteed to remember those things later. It's a bit more probabilistic. Like when learning a particular list of words, we might have an 80% probability of recalling the first word in an immediate free recall test, but only a 40% chance of recalling the 10th word, for example. So something is determining which items get into long-term memory and how well they get in, how easily we can get them back out. Now we've learned that rehearsal is one factor like that. Repeating something over and over increases our long-term memory for it. But clearly that's not the only way we can get things into long-term memory. And as we're gonna see, it is definitely not the best way. So this video is gonna talk about some theories and some empirical evidence relating to how we encode things into long-term memory and retrieve items back out. Now I wanna start with a fun little demonstration. So you'll need a pen and paper Pause the video if you need to go get pen and paper. Okay, so I'm gonna read you a little passage and I want you to just listen and afterwards try and remember this passage. So afterward, when I say recall, I want you to try and recall the passage on paper, like write down the whole thing, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it, just try and remember this passage while I read it. Here we go. The procedure is actually quite simple. First, you arrange things into different groups. Of course, one pile may be sufficient depending on how much there is to do. If you have to go somewhere else due to lack of facilities, that is the next step. Otherwise, you are pretty well set. It is important not to overdo things. That is, it is better to do too few things at once than too many. In the short run, this may not seem important, but complications can easily arise. It is difficult to foresee any end to the necessity for this task in the immediate future, but then one can never tell. After the procedure is completed, one arranges the materials into different groups again. They can be put into their appropriate places. Eventually they'll be used once more and the whole cycle will then have to be repeated. Okay, pause the video and write that down. All right, assuming you paused and gave it a shot, let's see how you did. <clears throat> did the passage make sense to you? Did you understand what it was describing? Most people, after hearing that, are totally lost. Like when they're listening to it, they're like, what? When we as experimenters go and grade the details of what people write down afterward, it's often way off or they're missing lots of elements from the passage. And that's because when we heard the words, we didn't have any context for what we were hearing. But if I told you that passage was about doing laundry, the activity of doing laundry, then the passage has some organizing kind of meaning or structure to it. Each of the sentences suddenly clicks into place a lot more. So let me read it again and see if it makes more sense. The procedure is actually quite simple. First, you arrange things into different groups. Of course, one pile may be sufficient depending on how much there is to do. If you have to go somewhere else due to lack of facilities, that is the next step. Otherwise, you are pretty well set. It is important not to overdo things. That is, it is better to do too few things at once than too many. In the short run, this may not seem important, but complications can easily arise. It is difficult to foresee any end to the necessity for this task in the immediate future, but then one can never tell. After the procedure is completed, one arranges the materials into different groups again. They can be put into their appropriate places. Eventually, they will be used once more and the whole cycle will then have to be repeated. Makes way more sense now, right? Now that we know it's about laundry. And sure enough, people's memory for that passage and each of the steps and each of the details mentioned in it is just way better with that context. So in one condition, we can give the context to people first by telling them it's about laundry or showing them a laundry picture. And sure enough, their memory is way, way better. So when the context is known ahead of time, the same words, you're hearing the same story, right? You're hearing it the same but the same words get encoded in a different way, in a way that makes them much easier to retrieve. So that's what we'll be kind of theorizing about and investigating here. These connections to the purple box in our modal model, the connections to and from long-term memory. So the way we create long-term memory, the encoding, 
uh, the experience we have that, that creates long-term memory, that matters. That affects how well we can remember it later during the retrieval phase where we're pulling it back out of long-term memory. So in the case of the laundry story, we can hear the exact same stimulus, but it's encoded way differently when we have that level of meaning as an organizing principle, right? So the level at which we process information when we're exposed to it, that's part of how effective the encoding ends up being. Which brings us to a famous theory of, of long-term memory called Levels of Processing Theory, or LOP theory, by Craik and Lockhart. Their idea was that our memory depends on how the encoding is done, and some ways of encoding information are just better than others, which makes sense. And specifically, their theory was that deeper encoding is better for long-term memory than shallow encoding. Basically, if you process things in a deep way, that's going to help your memory for it way more than if you only shallowly process it in the most kind of simple and surface way. So they came up with a way to test this, operationalizing this idea of deep versus shallow. They exposed people to a, like a list of words, not knowing it was a memory test. So this is kind of a little bit of deception here. They're going to come in and do a task where they happen to run into some words during this task but they don't know they're going to be asked to remember them later. Instead, each time a word pops up on the screen, the participant is just asked some yes or no question about each of the words. So imagine you're a participant in this study. You come in, you sit down at the computer, and one at a time a word comes up on the screen, and you're asked if the word is in all caps or not. <laughs> and you just have to press a button for yes or no, and then another word comes up on the screen, and you just have to say if it's in all caps or not. Like, you can do this without any thought at all, right? Or same thing if we ask you to just say, is this word in italics or not, right? So this is basically a simple perceptual task. You're interacting with the stimulus in a really surface level way. It's just about the structure of the stimulus, right? You don't even need to think about what the words are, just the shape of things, like whether the letters are all big or not. Easy peasy. You, you click through the task, and at the end, there's a surprise you are given a surprise memory test. You're asked to recall those words that you'd been going through this whole task just saying yes or no for, and you'd probably be like, what the hell? I don't know, I wasn't paying attention to what the words were, just whether they were in all caps or not. But here's the clever part then of, of Craig and Lockhart's levels of processing study. They had a different condition. So one condition was just asked for those structural features, like is it in all caps? In a different condition, a participant comes into the lab, they have no idea it's a memory study, so they just sit at a computer and a word comes on the screen and they have to answer a yes or no question. But in this case, whether it rhymes with something, like the word map shows up and you have to answer if it rhymes with cap, or the word book shows up and you have to answer if it rhymes with toast. So it's like yes, no, yes, yes, no, yes, no, no. You just go through the task simply answering if the words rhyme. So your whole way of interacting with the material, with the, the stimuli, with the words, is at a phonetic level or a phonemic level, right? It's just based on how the words sound. And once again, at the end, you're given a surprise memory test. And we see how many of those words you can write down even though you didn't know you need to remember them when you were just doing the simple rhyming task with it. So that was the, the phonetic condition. But then Craig and Lockhart had one more condition. So same setup here. People come into the lab, sit down, no idea it's a memory task. Now you're not told that you need to remember the words or anything. Instead, what you're told, each word comes up on the screen and you're just asked, like, could you use this for fishing? Or is this bigger than a car? Or does this word relate to politics? Or something else that's about the semantics, about the meaning of the word. So to answer yes or no in this condition, you have to actually think about what the word is and what the word means, kind of what its associations are. And once again, at the end, you're going to get surprised with an unexpected memory test. You don't know that these words you've been answering questions about are ones you're supposed to remember. So how did people do in these three different conditions? Well, the group that was interacting with the words in a semantic, meaning-based way, they remembered way more than those who interacted based on just how the words sound. And those, in turn, kicked the ass of people who were just judging all caps or not, structural features. And remember, they didn't know ahead of time that they'd be tested on the words. So we're studying the kind of like long-term memory encoding that happens automatically just based on what you're doing with the information that you're exposed to. It seems to make a big difference. And that's the idea of levels of processing theory.
In fact, we can go even deeper as a level of processing. We, go, we can go even deeper uh, than processing things in a semantic way. For example, there's also something called the self-reference effect. It was discovered a few years later. Relating something to yourself can be even better for memory. So in this study, they just added a condition to the same setup that Craig and Lockhart had used. So you present an adjective word, and the participant answers a yes or no question about each word. So some participants are asked, does this adjective have many letters? So basically, is it a long word or not? Just a purely structural way of interacting with the stimuli, not very deep processing. Others are asked, does this adjective rhyme with whatever? So that's a phonetic processing, right? Or phonemic, based on how it sounds. Others are asked, does this adjective mean the same as, you know, whatever? Like, is it a synonym for this other word, which requires processing the stimulus more deeply, where you have to actually pay attention and, and kind of process what the word is to remember what it means and make a comparison using it. So far, that's basically the same as Craig and Lockhart, right? And they include a surprise memory test at the end, see which group remembers the words more, despite having, you know, seen the same words for the exact same amount of time. But now for this study, they added one more condition. And that was for the same adjective, so using the same adjectives across different people. But now they ask for that adjective, does this adjective describe you? So now, if like, you know, the word coming up on the screen is giving or short, evil or dynamic or whatever, when that comes up on the screen, you have to not just think about the meaning of the words, but you have to make connections to the thing most relevant to your own life, which is you. And what did they find when they compared these four conditions? Well, for the first three conditions here in the graph, they, they replicated their earlier findings. Thinking about meaning, the semantic condition, leads to storing the most memory of the material, even though they weren't trying to remember it. And this is probably because thinking about the meaning of a word, it activates a lot of neural connections, lots of associations in your brain, right? Thinking about the meaning of the word elephant probably activates the neurons relating to concepts like animal, uh, large, gray, trunk, maybe the sound elephants make, anything else you know about elephants, a bit of all of that is kind of getting activated or at least pre-activated when you, when you think about or activate your concept of elephant at the level of meaning. So that means a lot of neural connections and might help you reactivate the concept a few minutes later during the memory task. But now look at their memory performance in that fourth condition that was added, the self-referential condition. It's even better, probably because relating information to yourself activates even more connections since we've got a hell of a lot of information in our brain related to ourself and our own life and all of our experiences. So maybe something like Lots of connections during encoding is what helps. Like lots of connections means you're able to retrieve that information more easily later. And we get that by processing things more deeply. In this case, the deepest way might actually just be processing it in a way that connects it to ourselves, right? But there are some significant problems or at least limitations with levels of processing theory that ended up making it, you know, not the central theory in, in psychology of memory uh, nowadays, kind of undermining it in some pretty significant ways. So first we got the issue of measurement. Like how do we measure depth? Is there an objective way to, to qualify what counts as deep or shallow? Like how do we quantify something as being a deeper type of processing than something else? And often, there's, there's generally kind of a circularity here in the definition, like deeper processing leads to better memory. Okay, but how do we know what conditions count as deep or shallow? Well, the ones we remember better must be deeper, right? The, the types of processing that give us the best results, those are the deep types of processing. Like if someone comes along and says they think semantic processing is the shallowest way of processing, and your only response is, no, it's, it's deep because look how good we are at remembering things after semantic processing, then you've just defined things circularly. And for that matter, the, the different levels, they aren't necessarily independent and the brain often works more in parallel, but the theory suggests these kind of distinct serial stages and it makes it sound like we only process at one depth or another when really our coding likely kind of spills over between the different depths or the different stages. Like we can't explain self-referential without semantic right, without meaning, and, and we can't explain semantic really without being able to perceptually process the word stimuli itself first. So even though Craig and Lockhart were right to focus on how we interact with information to make it clear that, you know, more than simple rehearsal determines what we remember, they were right about that, but their theory was incomplete at best. 
though it, it did provoke a bunch of work that filled in many of these gaps and many of the limitations of this theory. So for example, in the late 70s, uh, Morris, Bransford, and Franks, they did a study using a method really similar to Craik and Lockhart, where people were exposed to words either in a semantic task or a phonemic task. So either the, the words they were, you know, a word comes up on the screen and they're asked a question that's about the meaning of it or a question that's about the, the sound of it, the rhyming of it. So we might call this the, the study phase or the learning phase. Again, again they, they don't know that there's going to be a memory test at the end. That's still a surprise to the participants. So they aren't intentionally studying, right? They don't know they'll have to remember things later or be tested later. But we'll just call this the study phase, meaning when we're first exposed to the information or using the information. And, and in this case, they either used it in a semantic way or in a sound-based way. But rather than just testing the memory afterwards in a free recall test, what they did in this study was manipulate how the recall went. In other words, they manipulated the way that the, the, their word memory was tested at the end. So they had this factorial design with two independent variables. So one is the way the information was encoded during the exposure. That's the study, the way it was studied, right? Which Craig and Lockhart might call deep versus shallow processing. And then the way the information was prompted during retrieval later was their other independent variable. So using a, you might call it kind of a deep versus a shallow retrieval situation or retrieval task or test. So we got four conditions here. And you can see, just as a preview, from the plus signs here, that two of these conditions had better performance than the other two. People did best when retrieving or, or using the information in the same way that they initially learned it. So this is what the, the four conditions in this study were like. Like in the word presentation phase, right? The studying phase, the phase where it's just like some words come up on the screen and you have to do a little, you have to answer a little question about each one. Some people got semantic questions, like might ask, you know, if the word works in this sentence, the book was on the desk, right? Yes or no. And yeah, it works. Others got phonetic questions for their words where it might ask it, like if the word rhymes, like spear rhymes with fear, yes or no. In that case, it'd be a yes, right? But then of the semantic learning group, so the people who had been learning things based on meaning, some were tested phonetically at the end, like which of the following words rhyme with a word that you studied? In this case, it'd be look, since you saw book earlier, right? But other participants who had learned semantically, other people from that first group up here, they were tested with semantic memory questions at the end. Like, did you study a word related to a book of literature? Or, book would fit, right? Or did you study a word related to a long slice of pickle where, you know, spear would fit? And then likewise, for those who had learned the words during the phonetic task, half of them were assigned to get the phonetic memory testing at the end and half were assigned to get semantic testing at the end, right? It's a, it's a factorial design. So we've got four groups. So what were their results? The y-axis here, that's the proportion correct. So higher means better memory. The red bar is people who learn the words by answering rhyme questions. So they're the phonemic studying group, right? We got that in the little legend up here, red bar, phonemic studying. The green bar is those who process the words at a deeper level during their word exposure, during the, the studying phase, right? They were answering a semantic question about each word. So it looks kind of like semantic studying is better, just as, you know, Craig and Lockhart always said. These two bars here, that's just when the memory test later is asking semantic questioning. Now look at what happens in the conditions where the memory test later was asking via phonemic questioning. So in these right two bars, we see that actually the green bar is worse, that semantic processing of each word along the way seems to have actually been worse for memory than what we might think of as really shallow processing about rhymes. This is something that levels of processing theory just would not expect. What we have here is an interaction effect. The memory benefits of how you learn something depend on how you're going to retrieve it later. Now notice across all four of the conditions, the overall best memory performance did in fact come from a green bar, like encoding based on meaning. So if that's how you're tested at the end, then that is indeed the best way to learn and remember. But just keep in mind that when the memory test is asking you know, what Craig and Lockhart might call shallow questions, like, did you learn a word that rhymes with face? 
it's actually better to have studied in that same quote unquote shallow way. This was a huge, huge result, by the way, which, which really changed how we see long-term memory. Whereas levels of processing theory only cared about encoding, like how the encoding worked. It only cared about how you process something during that initial learning and exposure. We now see that it's about the match between encoding and retrieval that really matters for memory. And as we're gonna see, tons of subsequent studies have found a lot of memory effects that really support that idea. So let's start with one here. So for example, back in the 70s, a couple of cognitive psychologists named Godin and Badele were at a conference that just happened to be near a beach. And during breaks from the conference, some of the attendees would go out and do some scuba diving at the beach. Well, based on discussions about memory that were happening at the conference, Godin and Badele had this idea to do a little study there at the beach. They wanted to study that idea about the match between encoding and retrieval. So what they did was randomize participants into two groups. One group learned a list of words while they were dressed up in the full scuba gear, but still sitting on the dock. So they learned on dry land. The other group got in the water first. So same, out, same scuba outfit and everything, but they got in the water and then they learned that same list of words, but while they were underwater. So this is the study phase, right? The learning phase, when you're exposed to the information. They actually made sure, by the way, the experimenters to present the, the words in a consistent way across conditions. So they did it identically through the equipment. And, and so the presentation was as similar as possible for both groups. They heard the exact same words at the exact same rate, stuff like that. So now, rather than shallow or deep processing, what we've got here is people just learning in different environments, right? We might, we might even joke that Craig and Lockhart would love the underwater conditions since it's deeper, right? But now the, the clever part of this beach experiment is what they did in the testing phase afterward. So after people had studied, when people had to go back and recall the words, they did this clever design. So for each of the two groups, whether the person had studied on dry land or underwater, half of each group did their memory test on dry land and half of each group did their memory test underwater. In both cases, they basically what they, they did to make it kind of the same, uh, the action the same for each of them. They had the participants write the words out on a slate using chalk, since that works underwater as well as on dry land. So they made everything as similar as possible. And what we've got here is another factorial design, right? Four different groups here, factorial design, similar to the, the Morris study that we talked about earlier. But now it's not about semantic versus phonemic conditions. There's no shallow versus deep learning here. It's more about the environment matching during encoding and retrieval, right? And here's what Godin and Badele found. So let's look at just one part of this graph at a time. It takes a while to make sense of interaction effect graphs. So we're looking here at an average number of words recalled. So this is just how good the memory was. Basically higher is better memory. And the x-axis here, that's where the person did the learning right? Well, the two colored lines here, we can see in the legend, the two colored lines here are for telling us where the testing happened at the end, their recall environment at the end being dry or wet. So if I ask you a question like, is it better to learn on dry land or underwater? We've got kind of a weird situation here where there's no right answer. Like look at the red line, just looking at the red line. For people who did the recall test on dry land, they definitely do benefit from learning in a dry environment. But don't jump ahead of yourself and say learning in a dry environment is best because now look at the green line. The green line is people who are tested underwater. Their recall was tested underwater. Suddenly learning on dry land sucks. You would rather have learned underwater, right? So there's an interaction effect here. We can't talk about the best way to learn unless we also talk about the way it'll be retrieved or tested later. The best performance here comes when encoding environment, right? the environment during your encoding, matches the retrieval environment. If you're going to be tested underwater, then it's best to actually learn underwater. If you learn on dry land, you're going to remember that stuff better if you're tested on dry land again later. And this isn't just the case for wet versus dry. We could compare learning on a dock versus learning in a grass field and then test some people for recall on the dock and some people in the grass field. And once again, the best performance comes from those whose environment or context matches the learning and the testing, right? Matches the encoding and the retrieval. We actually have a term for this, this effect. It's called encoding specificity. So memory is best 
when the context and the information that's available during encoding is also present during retrieval. It provides kind of a cue, a reminder, right? So at the extreme, like learning things in a red room and then being tested in a blue room will probably lead to uh, worse memory than learning in a red room and being tested in that same red room. More realistically, for day-to-day -day experiences, this applies to things like a student studying in a silent versus a noisy environment and then taking their test later in a silent versus a noisy environment. Likewise, listening to music while you study might keep you motivated, but it might later impede your retrieval if you can't you know, listen to the same music during the exam. Basically, encoding specificity is about <clears throat> the environment or the context matching between our encoding time and our retrieval time. <clears throat> now, there's also a similar effect called state-dependent learning, which is that memory is best when your inner state, like your mood or whatever, during the encoding matches your inner state during retrieval. So a classic example of this from the laboratory, they brought in volunteers and they randomized them into two groups. They made one set of participants sad and the other set happy, which is not as hard as you think. We do these manipulations all the time. Like you could have them come in and you watch them like, or they watch you, I don't know, torture puppies or something that makes you sad. Or you could have someone just come in and write down their set. We don't actually torture puppies. You could have them, you know, write down their saddest childhood memory or their happiest childhood memory. That might make some people sad and some people happy, right? Or have them watch a sad movie clip and the others watch a happy movie clip. Or have them read a vignette that we know tends to make people sad or a vignette that ten we know tends to make people happy. And of course, after we do that, we usually do a manipulation check just to make sure their mood actually changed in the direction we expected. But anyway, that's what they did in this study. They manipulated the inner state of the participants, in this case, their mood. Then they had these people study a list of words while they're in that emotional state. Now we could stop there, right? We could stop the study here and just test their memory and see if people learn best when they're sad or when they're happy. But that's not what state-dependent learning is about. It's about a more fundamental facet of memory, which is that match between encoding and retrieval. So we're once again going to do a factorial design to mix up all four possible combinations. So some of the people who were made sad originally during their studying, we're going to bring them back later for a second session, maybe on the next day, bring them back and on that second session, we're going to make those people sad again. Well, others, the sad group from yesterday, we're going to bring in today, but this time we're going to make them happy. Okay. Likewise, for those who are happy during the studying, half of them are going to get brought back during the next session, the next day, and we'll make them sad. And the others will bring back again half of them, but we'll make them happy again. Then in this second session, we're going to have them do a recall task. We're having them recall the words from the first session. So if we do this, what do we find? Sure enough, we get an interaction effect again. There is no statistical difference between the, the two orange bars here. And likewise, there's no statistically significant difference between the two blue bars here. But the orange and the blue conditions are different. The conditions where mood matched between the encoding phase and the retrieval phase, that had much better memory than the conditions where mood didn't match. It's not that being sad or happy during learning is going to make you remember things better, but reactivating that same mood, that same inner state, that acts as a cue or a connection, a reminder between the prior time and the present time, actually making our memory performance better thanks to that match. So that is state dependent learning, our inner state matching. By the way, the same thing has been shown for your inner pharmacological state. If someone's sober when they're learning, then they will remember things better if they're also sober during their attempt to remember later. But funnily enough, if someone is drunk during the learning phase, we found that they actually remember worse if they're sober during the testing later. Which, by the way, is not advice to get drunk for your exams in school, but because you know, not only will you get in trouble, but in general, there is a performance decrement with alcohol, especially during the learning. And our best memory performance is sure enough when we're sober for both the learning and the recall. But this kind of result does remind me of a funny historical anecdote from a, an old physiology textbook in the 1800s. So in John Eliotson's physiological textbook back in the uh, 19, or sorry, 1835, he had this story, he gives this funny story. Dr. Abel informed me of an Irish porter to a warehouse who forgot when he was sober what he had done when he was drunk. <laughs>
But being drunk, he again recollected the transactions of his former state of intoxication. On one occasion, being drunk, he had lost a parcel of some value. And in his sober moments, he could give no account of it. So basically, he forgot where he left the package. Next time he was intoxicated, though, he recollected that he had left the parcel at a certain house, and there being no address on it, it had remained there safely and was got on his calling for it. This man must have had two souls, one for his sober state and one for him when drunk. Now, this is, this is a perfect example of state-dependent learning and, and a reminder that sometimes what we need to jog our memory are cues or, or connections to the previous situation when our brain did lay, uh, like lay down that information originally. So if you reactivate some of those cues by being in a similar environment, or in this case, by being in a similar inner state, you're more likely to also reactivate the memory itself. And just by the way, this same effect has been shown for other drugs, not just alcohol. So caffeine, for example, is a drug. If you always study with coffee, then it turns out having a similar amount of coffee before an exam will indeed improve your performance a little bit compared to not being similarly caffeinated on the exam. Again, that's just state-dependent learning. Finally, there's one more effect that speaks to this match between encoding and retrieval being a big factor in our remembering. So think back to that Morris, Bransford, and Frank study where people interacted with a list of words by doing either shallow phonemic processing or quote unquote deeper semantic processing. And then they were tested in one of those two different ways, right? That's where we originally saw this whole match between encoding and retrieval making a difference. But notice this isn't about the environment matching like with encoding specificity. And it's not about the inner state matching like with state dependent learning. So we've got a name for this other effect, which is transfer appropriate processing. Basically memory is best when the type of task or, or processing at the time of encoding, when it matches the type of task or processing during retrieval. In other words, forget levels of processing theory. We don't wanna focus solely on deep versus shallow processing, but on processing that's appropriate for how we're gonna use that information later when we try to retrieve it. We want transfer appropriate processing, not just deep processing. This means that the effectiveness of a learning strategy can only be determined relative to the specific testing or retrieval task that we have later. The implication here is that for simple memory performance, you should study material the way it'll be tested. On a like high school level exam, the multiple choice questions might test you on regurgitating a definition or just shallowly remembering things and spitting them back out. In which case, studying in that shallow way can work really well. But in like an upper division college course, multiple choice exam questions might actually force you to apply your understanding of the concept to some new situation, or even synthesize together multiple pieces of information in new ways. And if that's how you're gonna be tested, then your studying needs to also go beyond shallow, quizzing yourself on just you know definitions or something. Likewise, if you wanna learn a new language for your trip to France next year so that you can interact with people who live there, keep in mind that you're gonna remember the vocabulary better if during your learning you're practicing it conversationally, not just writing the words out over and over on paper. Because when you go to retrieve it in person in France, it's gonna be in conversation with people. So process the material in a way that matches how you'll be processing things when you wanna retrieve it later. So all three of these effects that we just talked about, they're really teaching us the same basic lesson. Processing and encoding and retrieval should match. That's a big determinant of whether you'll remember something. But just like we saw with rehearsal, just because something is a factor in long-term memory doesn't mean it's the only factor in long-term memory. So let's talk about some other effects that cognitive psychologists have found that improve our likelihood of remembering something. One trick that seems to work for remembering words is putting them in a complex sentence. So in a classic study, we'll be less likely to remember the word chicken if it's in a simple sentence like, she cooked the chicken, than if it's in a complex sentence like, the great bird swooped down and carried off the struggling chicken, which actually leads to better memory, even though there's you know, more words there, more stuff to get in the way. Which sounds like this kind of thing would only help for word memory tasks, right? Not everyday memory except that the general pattern here is more about making additional connections during the encoding. In other words, more elaboration. That seems to be what helps. Another effect that can help memory is uh, using visual imagery. 
So this is actually part of the strategy for, for how a lot of world memory champions win memory competitions, despite being born with perfectly ordinary memory abilities. So like in one early study, the researchers used a paired associate learning task, where it was just pairs of words being presented to the participant during the learning, like chair tiger as one pair, and maybe bank train as another pair, and ball squirrel as the next pair, and so on. Then later at the end, they had a cued recall test. That just means the researchers would give one of the words from a pair, like chair, and the participant had to remember what word went with it. They'd have to remember tiger to get it correct. And during the, uh, the original word learning, so when people were seeing these pairs of words for their learning, for their studying, here's the thing. Researchers randomly assigned participants into one of two conditions. They either learned the word pairs by rehearsal, so they were told when they see the words on the screen, like ball, squirrel, they were told to repeat it out loud, right? To say it a few times, that's rehearsal. So ball, squirrel, ball, squirrel, ball, squirrel. Or in the other condition, participants were told each time the pair of words comes up on the screen, you want to visualize that word pair together. So if it was squirrel and ball, you might picture a squirrel with a ball, squirrel with a ball, squirrel ball, right? Connected in some visual way rather than just repeating the sounds. And sure enough, when they did the cued recall test at the end, people in the visual imagery condition did the best. And it, it may not be that it's the visual part here that's doing the magic, but maybe it's just the fact that picturing it forces you to actively elaborate on the information. You have to fill in some extra details in your mind, like how big the squirrel is, what color the ball is, and that creates additional connections in your brain for you to reactivate as memory cues later. Meanwhile, we've seen another effect already that aids memory, and that's connecting something to yourself, making it relevant to yourself, what we'd call the self-reference effect. So if you link ideas to yourself, think about how they apply to you, what they mean to you, that can help your memory. After all, that immediately makes connection to lots of things since our concept of ourself has lots of detail, lots of experience to connect to. There's also something called the generation effect. Basically making connections or sentences or imagery, whatever, like we've talked about, but creating it yourself is better than using someone else's. So the act of like, a medical student coming up with a memorable mnemonic during their anatomy studying, that works way better than them looking up an existing mnemonic that someone else came up with online. Actively coming up with connections between ideas yourself is way better than passively being told these connections by someone else. So a good example of this early on was in a study where participants were trying to learn 600 nouns. So the researcher randomized participants into three groups for this to do this big memory test, trying to remember 600 nouns. In group one, for each of the 600 words on the list, the participant had to generate three words associated with it. They had to actively make some connections on their own. In group two though, they got the same 600 words that they're gonna have to memorize, but now for each of the 600 words, they were given three words that are associated with it, which actually came from those earlier participants. So we're using the same words that were used by the group one people, meaning we get equally connected, equally associated words for every item, uh, and that's, that's gonna match between group one and two. So the only difference between group one and two is whether those connected words were self-generated or other generated. And finally, they did have a third control condition with like no learning of those associated words prior to the test of the 600 items. Then at the end, for all these groups, they gave them a cued recall test. So they provide one of the three associated words as a cue and see if the participant remembers the original item. Now in group one, that meant they were seeing their own cue, but in groups two and three, that meant they were seeing cues provided by someone else. And the results were super clear. Group one did way better, way better than group two, who in turn did way, way better than group three. Our memory is best when we create our own connections and elaborations, when we're more active in the process. That's the generation effect. So create some of your own practice questions before an exam if you wanna really remember things rather than just relying on someone else's practice questions. And that brings me to the incredible memory benefits which we found when you simply go through the effort of retrieving information, basically practicing recall, meaning testing yourself or being tested. So we call this the testing effect. Being tested or, or testing yourself helps with your later retrieval. Doing practice questions when studying is one of the best ways to do well on an exam, especially if the questions are similar to the kind of questions you'll see on the exam. 
Like if it'll have short answer questions, practice writing some short answers. If it's gonna have multiple choice application questions, practice application. Let's see an example of this testing effect in the laboratory. So in 2006, Rodiger and Karpik, they had participants read a passage, like think just a textbook passage, right? They had participants read a passage that they would later be tested on, but after reading the passage one time, participants either were asked to recall as much as they could, basically testing their recall right, right, in the, right then and there, taking a test, or they were instead just asked to reread the passage a second time. So one group was doing rereading, kind of like if you go back and reread a chapter in a textbook a second time, while the other group only read it once, but then they had to try and actively remember as much as they could, basically doing practice questions kind of. So then there was a delay in this setup. They did a delay of either five minutes or in a different uh, version, they did a two day delay and then see how much people can remember. And in another version, they did a one week delay after which the participants were asked to recall as much of that passage as they could. And here's what they found. So the green bars here, that's the rereading group. The orange bars in each case, those are the, the testing group, the ones who practiced recalling the information, right? And then after a delay, we're gonna see how much stuck in long-term memory. So the ones who basically did practice, that's the orange bar. If we're talking about being tested after a five minute delay, so we just read the passage once and then we either reread it or got tested on it. Five minutes later, we wanna test your memory. Yeah, rereading is slightly better, although not by much, but look at what happens if we wanna remember something like a couple days or a week later or even longer. Now there's a clear and huge advantage for those who had previously gone through that attempted retrieval one time, even though they saw the passage half as much they got half as much exposure to that passage as the people who read it twice. That's the testing effect. And it's been replicated a ton. Practicing testing yourself or being tested is an amazing way to remember things later. All right, there are lots more well-studied factors that influence memory, but I'll just mention one more here before we move on, which is the spacing effect. Distributed practice is better than massed practice. Now, what does that mean? Distributed practice means spread your studying or your learning across different sessions, even if it's for shorter amounts of time. Whereas massed practice means doing all your practice together in a short period of time or in a single session, basically cramming. Now, you might wonder if there's a big compound here that you know someone who studies across lots of different days might just be spending more time overall on their studying. And that's a good point. But in studies of the spacing effect, we find that even for totally equal amounts of total time studying, so if we have the exact same amount of minutes spent studying for both groups, those who space it out, they do best. They show the best memory. So study often instead of all at once for better memory performance. There, there are a few reasons we think this works. So for one thing, it's difficult to maintain close attention throughout a long study session of multiple hours. So doing it in smaller chunks when you're kind of fresh can just be more efficient for the same time investment. Also, studying after a break gives you some feedback about what you already know, what you remember. So it's got that metacognitive element of helping you recognize what you remember and what you don't, which then lets you study more effectively from there. And also, if you're splitting your studying across more days, that's more time that your brain can kind of behind the scenes spend on consolidating the memories to make them more long lasting, more nights that your brain can process the information for you while you sleep. So the, the upshot here, the takeaway is that cramming is just less effective for long-term memory. Space things out, study in manageable chunks across time and you'll do better. Now, a couple more tips that, that come out of this understanding of memory processes like we've been talking about. First off, Beware the illusion of learning. This is a trap that often happens when someone thinks rereading or highlighting will help them remember something, despite all of our research showing it's not very effective. The problem with something like rereading a textbook chapter is that you're gonna get a sense of familiarity and recognition when you read something a second time, and that can mislead your brain into thinking you know the information or could recall it when it, it just actually, it just feels familiar and that's all. So a better strategy would be testing yourself because that gives actual feedback, what we call metacognition, you know, cognition about your cognition. And it avoids that false sense of confidence that can come from mere familiarity. Now this can actually be 
really helpful to realize because it doesn't just improve your performance, it can save you tons of time. I will say it and then say it again for those in the back, lots of time spent studying does not mean good results. It's about how you study, not how long you study. It's about the size of the study session, or it's not the size of the study session that matters, but the motion of the neural ocean. As the proverbial ladies will attest, length without technique isn't going to get the results you want. And another tip, take some freaking breaks. Like this is basically just applying that spacing effect that we just talked about, but it can work somewhat during like a long day of studying and cramming too. A lot of consolidation, which is something we'll talk about in an upcoming video. A lot of that happens during our breaks and during sleep, even if you just take a nap. Now, if you want to kick ass on your next exam, try to apply some of the other ideas we've talked about. So like elaborate, create associations, connections, imageries, and in, in any way you can, anything that connects to existing concepts and memories that are already stored in your brain. That leads to a richer representation and more ways to kind of cue the memory later. So if you really want to remember things, go beyond mindlessly highlighting things and get more active with the material, which as we saw, <clears throat> means you can kick ass if you generate some of your own practice questions and test yourself. Look back at the material, come up with some challenging short answer questions yourself about that material, and then actually sit down and write out your answers as if you were in the exam right now. That uses the generation effect and the testing effect. Also, organize the material. If there's lots of stuff, like in these videos, it can kind of be overwhelming for our brain to keep track of the organization and flow of everything all in the back of our head. But if you Slow down, take a minute, go explicitly, go back and look for the organization, sort things out yourself actively, create your own outline of the material or create a concept map, putting things together in a more meaningful and structured way. You're not only going to activate, you know, generating connections for yourself, but it also helps reduce the load on your memory because now with that organization and meaning, you're basically chunking things for your memory, which we know helps. Finally, Match your learning and testing conditions using those effects we talked about, like encoding specificity, state-dependent learning, and transfer-appropriate processing. Don't waste time on shallowly memorizing the exact wording of definitions if that's not how you're going to be tested on the concepts. Don't always study in your bed listening to heavy metal if you're not going to take the exam on your bed listening to heavy metal. If you're going to take a pen and paper exam that involves sh like writing a short essay, then practice writing short essays with pen and paper. Whereas if you're gonna take the GRE for graduate school or the MCAT for medical school, and those are administered on a computer, then try and take some of your practice exams on a computer. Match your encoding to how you'll be retrieving things later. Now, this often brings up a question for students. If I'm going to a face-to-face -face class for my initial learning of something, and then I'm doing my studying, say at the kitchen table at home, and then I have to go in and take the exam in a proctored computer lab, like how the hell do I apply encoding specificity since I can't study in the same environment I'll be, in test I'll be tested in later? And if I'm going to take a pen and paper exam in the big lecture hall that I'm learning in, does that mean I should go in and do all of my studying in that exact same room and I have to sit in that exact same seat? And you're right to wonder about that because yes, if you did your studying in that same room and potentially even the same seat as where you'll be tested later, it can help jog your memory. It'll have some effect, but that's not always realistic or it may have too many other trade-offs. Not to mention, sometimes we want to be able to retrieve the information later in our life and in other situations, not just for an exam. So we want to be able to generalize our learning across all environments. So. What you can do, if you want your brain to tie the information like to, or I guess if you, if you don't want the information to be tied so closely to a single learning location, then, then what you want to do is just study in lots of different circumstances. Change up the context a lot. So study and test yourself in different places and different times. Test yourself for a few minutes while waiting for the bus. Then go back and organize your notes later when you're at the kitchen table. Maybe create some of your own quiz questions when you're just hanging out on your bed or, or try recalling as much as you can while you lie there at night before falling asleep. Maybe you go to the library for some of your studying, do some of it at home, maybe the coffee shop for some of it. The more you change up those contextual factors and those cues that are present during your learning, 
the more that the learning will generalize and be easy to activate across a bunch of different contexts. Now, if you can't match context, if you can't study in the classroom, that means there, there is still a solution. You can still get the benefits, of, you, you can still make connections that'll help. In this case, you just wanna make lots and lots of connections so that whatever circumstance you're in later, whether it's an exam or trying to use this in your job or use this information later to make sense of, you know, in a future class or future life environment, then you'll be able to activate it because you made so many different connections with it. So it doesn't always have to be that you study in the exact same place in the exact same way as how you'll be tested, but rather it's about making as many connections as you can to, to increase the probability that your brain will reactivate that info later. But also, don't get too lost in any single strategy or effect that we've talked about. Big picture, look at what these things have in common and what they tell us about how memory works in general. And in general, all these memory strategies are creating richer representation of information by creating connections to existing memories or concepts, which we'll see later it really means creating additional neural connections in our brain, richer synaptic connections within the, the skull there. So when I say connections, think about how that fits all these things. Like when we talk about elaboration, that's just connecting things to other concepts or to yourself. When we talk about practicing retrieval, right, self-testing the testing effect, that's activating and strengthening or building neural connections to make them easier to reactivate the next time. When we talk about encoding specificity, that just means the info is connected, in this case, to external cues that can jog your memory if they're there during testing. When we talk about state-dependent learning, that's also about connections. In this case, the information's connected to internal cues that help your memory if they're there during testing, and so on anything you can do to lay down and reinforce those conceptual connections is laying down and reinforcing neural connections in your brain, which is what we'll need if we want to reactivate that same pattern of neural firing again in the future, which is basically what it is to remember something. Anyway, we'll stop there for these factors that influence memory performance. In the next video, I want to pivot to something else. We've been talking about long-term memory as this single unified thing, but in reality, there are lots of types of memory that would all qualify as long-term. So we're gonna investigate the various types of long-term memory, and I'll see you there.